The Name Day by Saki Adventures, according to the proverb, are to the adventurous. Quite as often, they are to the non-adventurous, to the retiring, to the constitutionally timid. John James Abbleway had been endowed by nature with a sort of disposition that instinctively avoids Carlist intrigues, slum crusades, the tracking of wounded wild beasts, and the moving of hostile amendments at political meetings. If a mad dog or a mad mullah had come his way, he would have surrendered the way without hesitation. At school, he had unwillingly acquired a thorough knowledge of the German tongue out of deference to the plainly expressed wishes of a foreign languages master who, though he taught modern subjects, employed old-fashioned methods in driving his lessons home. It was this uh, enforced familiarity with an important commercial language which thrust Abbeway in later years into strange lands where adventures were less easy to guard against than in the ordered atmosphere of an English country town. The firm that he worked for saw fit to send him one day on a prosaic business errand to the far city of Vienna, and, having sent him there, continued to keep him there, still engaged in humdrum affairs of commerce, but with the possibilities of romance, an adventure, or even misadventure jostling at his elbow. After two and a half years of exile, however, John James Abbleway had embarked on only one hazardous undertaking— and that was of a nature which would assuredly have overtaken him sooner or later if he had been leading a sheltered stay-at-home existence at Dorking or Huntington. He fell placidly in love with a placidly lovable English girl, the sister of one of his commercial colleagues, who was improving her mind by a short trip to foreign parts, and in due course he was formally accepted as the young man she was engaged to. The further step by which she was to become Mrs. John Abbleway was to take place a twelve-month hence in a town in the English Midlands, by which time the firm that employed John James would have no further need for his presence in the Austrian capital. It was early in April, two months after the installation of Abbleway as the young man Miss Penning was engaged to, when he received a letter from her, written from Venice. She was still peregrinating under the wing of her brother, and as the latter's business arrangements would take him across to Fium for a day or two, she had conceived the idea that it would be rather jolly if John could obtain leave of absence and run down to the Adriatic coast to meet them. She had looked up the route on the map, and the journey did not appear likely to be expensive. Between the lines of her communication there lay a hint that if he really cared for her, Abbleway obtained leave of absence and added a journey to Fiume to his life's adventures. He left Vienna on a cold cheerless day. The flower shops were full of spring blooms, and the weekly organs of illustrated humor were full of spring topics, but the skies were heavy with clouds that looked like cotton wool that has been kept over long in a shop window. Snow comes, said the train official to the station officials, and they agreed that snow was about to come. And it came rapidly, plenteously, the train had not been more than an hour on its journey when the cotton-wool clouds commenced to dissolve in a binding downpour of snowflakes. The forest trees on either side of the line were speedily coated with a heavy white mantle, the telegraph wires became thick glistening ropes, the line itself was buried more and more completely under a carpeting of snow, through which the not very powerful engine plowed its way with increasing difficulty. The Vienna Fiume line is scarcely the best equipped of the Austrian state railways, and Abbleway began to have serious fears for a breakdown. The train had slowed down to a painful and precarious crawl, and presently came to a halt at a spot where the drifting snow had accumulated in a formidable barrier. The engine made a special effort and broke through the obstruction, but in the course of another twenty minutes it was again held up. The process of breaking through was renewed, and the train doggedly resumed its way, encountering and surmounting fresh hindrances at frequent intervals. After a standstill of unusually long duration in a particularly deep drift, the compartment in which Abbleway was sitting gave a huge jerk and a lurch, and then seemed to remain stationary. It undoubtedly was not moving, 
and yet he could hear the puffing of the engine and the slow rumbling and jolting of wheels. The puffing and rumbling grew fainter, as though it were dying away through the agency of intervening distance. Abelway suddenly gave vent to an exclamation of scandalized alarm, opened the window, and peered out into the snowstorm. The flakes perched on his eyelashes and blurred his vision, but he saw enough to help him realize what had happened. The engine had made a mighty plunge through the drift and had gone merrily forward, lightened of the load of its rear carriage, whose coupling had snapped under the strain. Abelway was alone, or almost alone, with a derelict railway wagon in the heart of some Styrian or Croatian forest. In the third-class compartment next to his own he remembered to have seen a peasant woman who had entered the train at a small wayside station. "'With the exception of that woman,' he exclaimed dramatically to himself, "'the nearest living beings are probably a pack of wolves.' Before making his way to the third-class compartment to acquaint his fellow-traveller with the extent of the disaster, Abbeway hurriedly pondered the question of the woman's nationality. He had acquired a smattering of Slavonic tongues during his residence in Vienna, and felt competent to grapple with several racial possibilities. "'If she is Croat or Serb or Bosniak, I shall be able to make her understand,' he promised himself. "'She is Mudja. Heaven help me. We shall have to converse entirely by signs.' He entered the carriage and made his momentous announcement in the best approach to Croat speech that he could achieve. The train has broken away and left us. The woman shook her head with a movement that might be intended to convey resignation to the will of heaven, but probably meant non-comprehension. Abelway repeated his information with variations of Slavonic tongues and generous displays of pantomime. Ah! said the woman at last in German dialect. The train has gone? We are left? Ah, so. She seemed about as much interested as though Abelway had told her the result of the municipal elections in Amsterdam. They will find out at some station, and when the line is clear of snow, they will send an engine. It happens that way sometimes. We may be here all night, exclaimed Abelway. The woman nodded as though she thought it possible. "'Are there wolves in these parts?' said Abelway hurriedly. "'Many,' said the woman. "'Just outside this forest my aunt was devoured three years ago, as she was coming home from market. The horse and a young pig that was in the cart were eaten too. The horse was a very old one, but it was a beautiful young pig, oh, so fat. I cried when I heard that it was taken. They spare nothing.' They may attack us here, said Abelway tremulously. They could easily break in. These carriages are like matchwood. We may both be devoured. You, perhaps, said the woman calmly. Not me. Why not you? demanded Abelway. It is the day of St. Maria Cleopa. My name day. She would not allow me to be eaten by wolves on her day. Such a thing could not be thought of. You, yes, but not me. Abelway changed the subject. It is only afternoon now. If we are to be left here till morning, we shall be starving. I have here some good eatables, said the woman tranquilly. On my festival day, it is natural that I should have provision with me. I have five good blood sausages. In the town shops, they cost twenty-five hella each. Things are dear in the town shops. "'I will give you fifty heller apiece for a couple of them,' said Abelway with some enthusiasm. "'In a railway accident things become very clear,' said the woman. "'These blood sausages are four kronen apiece.' Four kronen!' exclaimed Abelway. Four kronen for a blood sausage?' "'You cannot get them any cheaper on this train,' said the woman with relentless logic. "'Because there aren't any others to get.' In Agram you can get them cheaper, and in Paradise, no doubt, they'll be given us for nothing. But here they cost four kronen each. I have a small piece of Emmentaler cheese, and a honey cake, and a piece of bread that I can let you have. That will be another three kronen, eleven kronen in all. There's a piece of ham, but I cannot let you have on my name day. Abelway wondered to himself what price she would have put on the ham and hurried to pay her the eleven kronen before her 
emergency tariff expanded into a famine tariff. As he was taking possession of his modest store of eatables, he suddenly heard a noise which set his heart thumping in a miserable fever of fear. There was a scraping and shuffling, as of some animal or animals trying to climb up to the footboard. In another moment, through the snow-encrusted glass of the carriage window, he saw a gaunt, prick-eared head, with gaping jaw and lolling tongue and gleaming teeth. A second later another head shot up. There are hundreds of them, whispered Abelway. They have scented us. They will tear the carriage to pieces. We shall be devoured. Not me on my name day. The holy Maria Cleopa would not permit it, said the woman with provoking calm. The heads dropped down from the window in an uncanny silence fell on the beleaguered carriage. Abelway neither moved nor spoke. Perhaps the brutes had not clearly seen or winded the human occupants of the carriage and had prowled away on some other errand of rapine. The long, torture-laden minutes passed slowly away. "'It grows cold,' said the woman suddenly, crossing over to the far end of the carriage where the heads had appeared. "'The heating apparatus does not work any longer.' See, over there beyond the trees there is a chimney with smoke coming from it. It is not far, and the snow has nearly stopped. I shall find a pass through the forest to that house with the chimney. But the wolves! exclaimed Abelway. They may... Not on my name day, said the woman obstinately, and before he could stop her she had opened the door and climbed down into the snow. A moment later he hid his face in his hands. Two gaunt lean figures rushed upon her, from the forest. No doubt she had courted her fate, but Abelway had no wish to see a human being torn to pieces and devoured before his eyes. When he looked at last, a new sensation of scandalized astonishment took possession of him. He had been straightly brought up in a small English town, and he was not prepared to be the witness of a miracle. The wolves were not doing anything worse to the woman than drench her with snow as they gambled round her. A short, joyous bark revealed the clue to the situation. "'Are those... dogs?' he called weakly. "'My cousin Carl's dogs, yes,' she answered. "'That is his inn over beyond the trees. "'I knew it was there, but I did not want to take you there. "'He is always grasping with strangers. "'However, it grows too cold to remain in the train. "'Ah, ah, see what comes?' "'A whistle sounded, and a relief engine made its appearance.' snorting its way sulkily through the snow. Abelway did not have the opportunity for finding out whether Carl was really avaricious. 